Brother, I find this a bit difficult, but I am going to right now proclaim this be kind to Robert Clemens Day. Let's give him a hand. <laughs> And rather than my usual 15 to 20 minute long introduction, I'm going to go right to this gentleman. Lou Martin will talk about flying that big airplane behind you, C-133. It's got 4,700 miles in it during the war in Vietnam from 65 to 70. Let's give him a hand. Thanks, Vince. The uh, first I hope everybody got a piece of my birthday cake. Today is my birthday, actually June 8th. And today I turned 38, oh no, I got that turn around, 83. <laughs> Change those numbers around. I came from a very large family. There were 10 kids in our family. I was number nine. And there were seven boys and three girls. And all seven boys served in the military. Five during World War II and my younger brother and myself after the war. And today, now also Vince promised me a teleprompter. I don't know where it happened to it, but you know, the guy that spent the whole World War II writing backwards, what do you expect? <laughs> but I'm going to talk about the 133 today. Spook said he's going to the men's room because he already heard it. <laughs> but before I talk about the airplane, I want to tell you about this Irish immigrant who came to this country and finally became a citizen. And after he became a citizen, he started running for menial office jobs. See you later, Spook. I told you, I told you this, this one's going to be a little different. <laughs> anyway, this Irish immigrant, after he became a citizen, he started running for menial offices, like dog catcher and the school board and assemblyman. And this one year, he was very proud. He's elected alderman of the Fourth Ward in New York. And he went home to his wife, and he says, "No, sure, but golly, he says I better be a new, buy me a new hot." and a new coat to uphold the position of the Ottoman of the Fort Ward. And she says, yes, Patrick, and thank the but Jesus, I better be buying a new dress and a new bonnet to uphold the position of the wife of the Ottoman of the Fort Ward. And he says, hello, woman, faith and be Jesus, when I found you, all you had was your ass and your prayer book. And she says, yes, and faith and be Jesus, you paid much attention to the prayer book because my ass would be the Pope of Rome. <laughs> Anybody offended? <laughs> anyway. I think several people have had this good fortune of reading my book, Close Encounters. But, and I, there's a chapter here in the 133, but since it's my birthday, I told Vince I was gonna give everybody a freebie and talk a little bit about the 130 firsthand. This is the 130, that I wanted to hang that picture in my in our living room, but my wife said no way, <laughs> and I could understand. But I want to go back a little bit about how I got assigned to 133s. In the spring of 1964, when I was 36 years old, I was an engineering officer for an F-100 fighter squadron in Misawa, Japan, and getting ready to rotate back to the States. And I wanted to go back into transport because I had four years before I'd be eligible for retirement and I was thinking about a flying job after I retired. So I wrote to a friend of mine, a Major General Cunningham, and I asked him, he and I had flown together in Europe, remember the same ski team, and I asked General Cunningham if he could give me an assignment flying turboprops on the east coast of the United States. What I had in mind was a 130 squadron in McGuire, because I knew in the next couple of years they'd be converted to C-141s. And I figured if I could get into 130s, by the time I'd retire, I'd have a couple thousand hours in the four-engine transport, which would be in good stead for, for a flying job. Well, General Cunningham, good to his word, about two weeks later, I got a letter from General Cunningham and he basically said, Lou, good to hear from you. He says, I contacted your friend of mine in the Pentagon, and he said, I got you an assignment flying C-133s at Dover Air Force Base. I thought, C-133s? My God, I knew, I didn't know much about that airplane, but I knew it had a nefarious reputation. 
I was thinking of 130s. So I wrote back to General Cunningham and I said, General, I was hoping for 130s of McGuire. Can you change that assignment? General Cunningham wrote back and he said, Lou, he said, you asked for turbo props to the East Coast. And I'm, and I'm sure you're aware that doors on the East Coast and the 133 is a turbo prop. He said, I don't think it'd be fair for me to go back and change that assignment. He says, good luck and keep in touch. <laughs> so I reported, I did a little research on the 133. Now they built, it came out in the early 50s. First one flew in 1956. When it first came out, it was a very popular airplane. It was, it was a featured aircraft at the Paris Air Show. It airlifted some very heavy equipment. It, it, two, three of them flew around the world. And, but then in, the fifth, in 1958, catast catastrophe hit. We lost five C-133s in a relatively short period of time. Three of them disappeared over the ocean. Two over the Atlantic, similar to that Air France aircraft, just disappeared. No radio reports, a loss of a crew, just a little floating, floating wreckage. One lost over the Pacific when it took off from Tachikawa. Another one, after takeoff from Travis Air Force Base, crashed and burned, killed everybody on board. And uh, this particular accident, there were two brand new second lieutenant navigators that had reported the squadron and they were on that flight just to get flying time. Another one took off and crashed at Dover Air Force Base right after takeoff, everybody killed. And then one burned up in a refueling accident. And then there was another one that took out of Chateau, France. And at 10,000 feet when they were climbing, the airplane went into a sudden 90 degree bank to the right, 90 degree bank to the left. It started to stall. The aircraft commander put down the flaps 15, and he was able to land, but they didn't find anything wrong with the airplane. All of these accidents were listed as undetermined for the cause. I got to start my stopwatch. <laughs> <laughs> and this is what I was faced with when I went to Dover. I must admit, I guess coming from F-100s and other nefarious aircraft that there was a certain twinge of excitement of me going to this airplane, being part of this, to find out what the hell was going on. I reported to Dover in July 1964, and after a 60-day uh, ground school and flight training, I was flying as a co-pilot through missions to North, up to Tule, Greenland, into Europe, doing Christmas shopping. This was in the late fall of 1964. And in November of 1964, I was co pilot an aircraft we at the lodges coming back to Dover. And we heard that one crashed and burned, taking off from Goose Bay, Labrador. Everybody on board killed. Got back to Dover, flew a few missions around the States, and in January 1965, one crashed after a night takeoff of Lake Island killing everybody on board. This was the eighth aircraft that was lost. The, the pace with this, the Air Force grounded the airplanes. They were thinking about taking them out of the inventory, but as you recall, the Tonkin Bay incident in November of, of August 1964, the SS Maddox, that was generated by Johnson and team, the thing in Vietnam was starting to get excited, and the grounding couldn't have been at a worse time for the Air Force in the country. The C-133 was the largest aircraft flying at the time. It was a featured aircraft, like I say, at the Paris Air Show, and it, the 141 was not out yet. The C-5 was still on the drawing board, and it was a very critical to our war effort in Vietnam. Also, during that period of grounding, Rolling Thunder started in March of 1965, where President Johnson authorized the bombing of North Vietnam. And we sent 5,000 Marines to Da Nang after a lot of the BCs had attacked some of our advisors and killed 30-some. So the war was starting to heat up 
in Vietnam, and there was a, definitely a need for a large transport aircraft. In June, we were ungrounded, and if we have time later, I'll go into some of the reasons for the aircraft. We had so many problems with the aircraft. And all the crew members were told to be rechecked. We hadn't flown for about five months. We were to be rechecked in the former crew position with no upgrades, just to get the airplanes moving. My recheck as a co-pilot was with a Colonel Dyer from higher headquarters. It was a four-hour scheduled flight. And you people that fly, you know when you're doing things right and you know when you things aren't so well. That four-hour check for me was everything was working out just beautifully. I was a major, a co-pilot, but at the end of that check ride, Colonel Dyer said, Major Martin, he said, you flew that airplane better than most aircraft commanders. He said, I'm going to recommend you go directly to aircraft commander. So we went in to see Roy Myers, who was the ops officer, and he said, no, no way. He said, the, the rules are you'll be back to the same crew position you were before. So I stood there listening to this lieutenant colonel and major argue over me, and finally the major listened to the lieutenant colonel, and I was upgraded to aircraft commander immediately. I felt pretty good that it was less than a year from fine fighters to be an aircraft commander in transport. Then I went on a, an initial line check in the Pacific. At that particular time, the Nimwitz, Nimwitz in, in headquarters decided that we would, we would stage the aircraft, but that means, by that I mean when you'd land, you'd turn the aircraft over to a new crew, and a new crew would take the aircraft and move it on. But they didn't realize that the 133, with only 50 built, it was a roll aircraft. Very few parts took specialized mechanics. Where is Mike Koch? He was working with 133s. So when we would land someplace at Hickam, if I had to turn the airplane over to another crew, it would sit there for days because we had to write everything up. But if we could keep the airplane, we'd keep the, the minor discrepancies on a separate logbook and we'd continue the aircraft. So my first line check from California to Clark and back took 30 days. And initially, they said the 133s would not be allowed to fly into the combat zone. They were fear of losing them and having them grounding, and they call them uh, mortar magnets. So the DC would love to, to destroy a large aircraft. So we weren't allowed to fly into, com into the combat area. The following month, that restriction was removed, and I was making my first mission as an aircraft commander. This time I was going to Tonsonu. And we were going from Travis to Honolulu. We were about three or four hours over from Honolulu. And I looked up, and the number three starter light was on. We used these starters for starting the engine with high pressure, high temperature pneumatic air from the GPUs in the, in the, in the pods. The pods on the back were carrying the GPUs. Initially, when you start the engines, you direct this high temperature, high pressure air to turn the engines, and it would cut out at 40 40% RPM. But we were sitting there at cruise, and this number three starter light was on. Now the book says, shut down the engine. I had a discussion with the flight engineer, and he said, oh, I think it's a false indication. And I said, I don't know about that. The book says we should shut it down. We had, we had, we had burned enough fuel that we had a three engine altitude. So I said, no, shut the number three engine down. We went on to Hickam, and when they opened up the banana peel engine cowling, parts of that engine fell out of the ramp. It was very close to catching on fire in an area where there's no fire prevention. That was my kind of my first, first experience of, of an incident in the 133. Another one that I want to talk about is on the 133, we could, we could carry five Huey choppers on that airplane. Five, and full of blades. And a good mission for us would be land, go to Corpus Christi and haul five choppers into a combat zone. I had five Huey choppers on board, landed at Quinan. 
battle was raging around Queen Anne. You could hear the 105 howitzers going off, you hear small arms ammunition, uh, machine gun fire in the distance, and they're offloading by five helicopters. And this Marine Major came out and he said, Major, you've got to get that airplane out of here quick. He says, get those choppers off and get out of here. The VC have already spotted that airplane. So they loaded the first four off as an over-center over -center dolly. You always are in skids, as you know. They put the over-center dolly underneath it and drag it out. Well, the fourth, the fifth chopper, the axle broke on this over-center dolly. So they're all trying to figure out how the hell to get that fifth chopper off. And I stood out there and I said, do anything you want, put boards down and grease them or something, but don't tear up my airplane. I'm going to go get a cold drink. The war was raging around Queen Anne. I saw, I saw a shack over not too far away with an air conditioner sticking out. And I figured they might have some cold drink in there, so I walked in. There's two airmen in there watching television, black and white television, sitting on top of a steel cabinet. And as the 105 howitzers would go off, that cabinet would shake, and the picture would go blurred, and they were watching Gunsmoke. <laughs> So I asked these two airmen, I said, you guys have a cold drink? They said, sure, Major, right over there, help yourself. So I went over and got a cold, and I stood there watching Gunsmoke with them. And a little while later, an airman came in, and he said, Major, he said, they got that fourth helicopter off your airplane, and the Marines wanted to get out of here. So I never did get to see the final chapter of uh, Matt Dillon, who just recently died, Matt Dillon and Kitty. So as I left, these two of them were still watching Gunsmoke with the cabinet shaking as the 105s went off. Another incident, I landed at Tunsinut, Saigon, and we had opportune cargo to haul out of Tunsinut. And they said, my load, was a battle damage F-4 fighter to take back the States. They had it in three dollies, the fuselage in one dolly, the wings in another dolly, and then the tail in a third dolly. And it was relatively light load, so we'd be able to go right up to altitude. And I asked, I remember I asked the loading crew, I said, had that F-4 been purged of fuel? They said, yes sir, no, no problem. See the green tags hanging off of it? It's purged of all fuel. We we're taking off a of Saigon just at sunset, going over the South China Sea. Thunderstorms out in the area. And we took off, and I was trying to go up to about 21,000. I was steering around these thunderstorms using the airborne radar. And all of a sudden, the radar went shh. So I lost the radar. Now I was picking my way around these thunderstorms, lightning this way, go this way, lightning this way, go this way. I was over the South China Sea and we could smell JP4 fuel. So I told the engineer, go down to the car compartment, go downstairs and check. And he called the interphone and he says, Jesus, Colonel. He said, F4 is spewing out fuel like a fire hydrant. He said, the whole car compartment is awash with JP4 fuel, about a quarter inch. I couldn't believe it. I grabbed an oxygen mask and a walk around bottle and I went downstairs, and sure enough, there was about a quarter inch of JP4 fuel sloshing back and forth across the fuselage in the cargo compartment. I could see lightning strikes out through the windows, and I thought one spark and we'd be one big flash over the South China Sea. So I went back upstairs. I told the co-pilot, start descending, pull the power back, get a high angle of attack, and start descending, I told the engineer, get, get the cabin altitude as low as you can, because the cabin that was about 8,000 that was forcing all the fuel out of this JP-4 that was spewing fuel. And I went back downstairs, and we had, the navigator was sweeping the fuel into a pool towards the back. The load master had a squeegee rigger mop. He was mopping up fuel, and we were taking it, we were dumping out the outflow valve in the back. Before I went downstairs, the co-pilot said, should we get a radio clearance to descend? I said, hell no. One spark and we'll just be one big flash. As the thought went through my mind, I said, if we ended up in a big fireball, 
over the South China Sea, it'll be another 133 lost. It'll shut it, it'll straight, send them back to square one. And I wouldn't be around to tell them why the airplane lost. So finally, after a couple hours, we got all the fuel up. We were back down to 10,000 feet with the cabin altitude of zero. And we landed at Clark. When I made contact the radio, they said, geez, we, you had already been reported lost. We didn't know where the hell you were. I taxied into Clark, and some maintenance guy came on board the airplane. He says, I think you guys got a fuel leak. I just smelled JB4 fuel. <laughs> and I said, no shit, you know. <laughs> Take that F4 off the airport, and I'm not hauling it anymore. We left there, everything open that night. There was another incident when I was coming back from Vietnam, and I was at 23,000 feet east of Honolulu. And we, were, we had descent clearance. Co-pilot was going to fly, and he trimmed in the autopilot for the airplane to descend, and the airplane just kept on going. And he said, look at here, he said, I'm rolling in trim. The airplane's not descending. I said, she's going to roll it back. So I disconnected the autopilot, and we shoved on the yoke. We couldn't shove that forward on the yoke. We could pull up on the yoke, but we couldn't shove forward. It was locked. I had aileron, had rudder, of course I had differential power, but we couldn't shove forward on the yoke. It was locked. So he said, what the hell are we gonna do? Well, I said, well, we're sure as hell not gonna stay here. But so we held on the yoke and I rolled in up trim. So then the trim tab would go down and act as a mini elevator. We had differential control with the aileron and the rudder, and of course I could descent with the power. And I got on the glide slope, and I figured we'd go all the way down that way, and I could round down by hitting the end of the runway. At 10,000 feet, the yoke broke loose, and everything was normal. So when we landed, I made a very detailed write-up in the 781 detailing the problem. And I figured we'd spend two or three days in Honolulu enjoying Waikiki while they fixed the airplane. Twelve hours later, they called us and said, your airplane's ready to go. I said, what the hell did they do to fix that airplane? And I went out and looked at the aircraft log, and it said, ground checked okay. <laughs> so I asked for the senior maintenance officer who came out there, and I said, how the hell did you ground check? He said, the flight controls work fine. I said, did you take it up to 23,000? He says, no. He says, the ground check's okay. And I said, well, there's something wrong with those controls. I said, let's take these panels off underneath the control column. He said, that's a hell of a lot of screws, Colonel. I said, yeah, you had me a speed wrench out to remove one. You, you remove the other one. And I said, and after we get through, I want all those damn screws back in. Well, anyway, we pulled the panel off. The C-133 was a vibrating nightmare. The 18-foot diameter Curtis Logic Plus, the prop tips always spun at supersonic speed. So it set up tremendous vibration to the airplane. That was one of our big problems. Anyway, a piece of sheet metal, the rivets had snapped, and it was lodged against the yoke underneath the, the floor. So at high pressure with pressurization, the pressurization was holding that metal against the bottom of the yoke underneath the floorboard. But as we got to lower out to the natural spring of the metal, flopped it back so the, the fix was very simple. Got a sheet metal mat out there to fix it. I was taking off, we were in crew rest at Tachikawa, I mean, excuse me, at Kadena in Okinawa. And I had a hell of a time trying to go to sleep because the rain was buffing on that Quonset hut. The wind was blowing like hell. It was very noisy. And I just drifted off, and someone came in the building and said, you're to call the command post right away. So I called the command post, and I said, what the hell's going on? We're saying we're under typhoon evacuation. All the airplanes are supposed to leave Kadena and report. So get your crew and report to operations. I went down there, and there's a big, long crew, a line of crews getting their, their, excuse me, their assignment to where they were going to go. When my number came up, they said, you're to fly to Tachikawa. We thought, hey, that's great. That's a good shopping area. We'd be there two or three days. So we, went, we taxied out, raining like hell and blowing the airplane, rocking back and forth, a good stiff crosswind. 
Finally, my turn came to take off. We lined up, I turned the jet blast on, windshield wipers on high, and water injection on, and we got rolling down the runway, the aileron all the way over from the crosswind. When the co-pilot said go, which was the same as our V1, just as we rotated, there was a muffled explosion, and the instruments number three engine started unwinding. The engineer said, we're losing number three engine, and the nose cone is the reduction gear from the jet to the prop. He said, it's wobbling and coming apart. So, I wanted to sh we shut down the number three engine. Fortunately, it feathered. And I remember the co-pilot said, should I declare an emergency? We're going to go back into Cadena. And I said, hell no. If we let, in the first place, we go back to Cadena, the airplane won't be there tomorrow because of the typhoon. So we'll fly to Tachi on three engines, which is only about four hours. We landed at Tachikawa, had to wait for an hour for a parking spot. This was during the Vietnamese War. Tachi was extremely busy. Finally, when we got in, a place to park, some maintenance officer, captain, came on board in the deck. He says, why the hell did you bring a damaged airplane into my Tachikawa? He says, we don't have any 130 mechanics or an engine or anything. And I said, well, you're going to have to find him someplace. So we spent about three or four days there while they changed the engine and the prop had to be brought in by a 124. I'm going to talk a little bit about the Tet Offensive, which started, as you recall, when? February 1968. That's right, Steve. <laughs> September, you were over there. September 1968. It's a Buddhist holiday. They had formed a truce between the VC and the North Vietnam and the South Vietnam. In fact, the South Vietnam had put many of their troops, gave them a couple of weeks leave so they can enjoy the holidays. Well, the North Vietnamese launched a World War II style attack with tanks, artillery, uniformed troops, thousands of them marched into South Vietnam. Our mission in this 133 was to support the 25th Infantry Division from Honolulu to Pleiku in the highlands. In that 30 day period, a little over 30 days, I flew over 200 hours. And again, these nitwits in headquarters, they said when we get into that area at night, once we're below 10,000 feet, we're to turn off our navigation lights and our rotating beacons. When I was descending in the stack, I got down to nine, below 10,000 feet, I turned all the lights off. I was only at 9,000 feet, and I saw a dark shadow go right over the top of us, by a couple hundred feet. I reached up and turned all the lights on. I had a wing wing right in the jump seat. And he said, Colonel, here, those lights are supposed to be off. And I said, not this airplane, they're off. I'm a hell of a lot more afraid of a mid-air collision than I am about ground fire. He was so mad when we landed. He went this way when we had a cold coat. He wouldn't talk to me. Interesting thing. That, that directive was, was rescinded, where we could leave our lights on all the time. But fast forward about 23 years, my son was flying KC-135s during Gulf War I. And he was refueling F-5s and F-16s over Iraq. And they were told when they get down to low altitude to refuel the aircraft to turn all their lights off. That they turned the lights on and they rescinded that directive too. But that was 23 years after these idiots told us to do the same damn thing. And during the Tet Offensive, I'd come back from, from Playco and I was at Kadena. And they called us on a crew rest and said, We have a special mission for you to Kaysan. Quezon is a, was a big base up near Da Nang. President Johnson said he didn't want another Dien Bien Phu, a loss of the, of the station. He told the Marines to hold that, air at that station at all costs. Our mission, they said the Marines were running out of small arms fire, mortar rounds, and hand grenades. They said they were putting about 50,000 pounds of small arms ammunition in our airplane, got an intelligent briefing, and they said they didn't have a 130, so they're going to use a 133 as a kind of an assault transport to fly 
small arms ammunition and so on into the Marines. The intelligence officer said the field is under attack. You can expect ground fire when you make your descent. So make a steep approach and you might pick up a few Huey choppers to suppress the ground fire. Do not shut down your engine. Stay in the ground a minimum amount of time. And once they offload the ammunition, get the hell out of there and come back. I landed at this 5,000 foot strip kind of like an assault transport, the 133. Full reverse, anti-skid braking. Runway was so narrow when I got to the end, I had to go back and forth, reverse thrust and forward thrust, even turn around. We lowered the ramps in the back and the Marines in kind of a conga line were offloading the ammunition and the stuff we had on board. This major came on board and said, boy, you're a blessing. I'm sure glad you brought this stuff in. The engineer, who was making a walk around. We didn't shut down the engines. He was making a walk around. He came back up in the cockpit. He said, Colonel, he says, we blew a tire on the right rear truck. It's in shreds. So I went out and looked at this tire, and sure enough, it was in shreds. She's him. At the same time, the Marines was getting close to sunset. He said, you got to get this airplane off. The VC have already seen it. And I didn't want to take off with that tire in shreds. I would come to pieces and jam the gear. So I asked the engineer, I said, do you have a hacksaw? And he said, sure. So we took turns with a hacksaw, cutting sections of that tire off down through the steel beam and throwing it off. We got down to just the rim. Then we took off, very light, making a steep climb. And we did see a few tracers trying to pick us up as we left. We flew back to Kark, Kark Island. And some maintenance lieutenant colonel came on board. He said, Colonel, you know, you blew a tire landing here at Kark. And I says, no, no, we didn't blow a tire landing at Kark. We cut it off over in Vietnam. He says, who gave you authority to do that? <laughs> <laughs> and he says, I, he says, I've got to write a report on this. And I said, you do what you want. I said, we're going to go have a beer and a steak and a shower, maybe in that order. He did write a report and I got down to my base at Dover. General Wallace, who was our wing commander, and hell of a nice guy. He called me, he said, what the hell is this, Lou? And I told him about it, he says, well, file 13, hell with it. <laughs> the Joint Intel Offensive, I want to stick a little bit more about this because it's so interesting. I was given a check ride, so I wasn't assigned any particular aircraft. And we got into Saigon, there was a friend of mine who had been stationed at Dover, now he was stationed in Saigon. And we, normally we weren't allowed to stay overnight. He says, why don't you come stay overnight with me in my apartment? And he'll leave tomorrow. And I says, that's fine. So I went with him, I was going to sleep in the sofa. We went to his apartment on the fifth floor. This was during the Tet Offensive. We were standing there drinking a martini. See the AC-47s off in a distance dropping flares and the streamers coming down from their Gatling guns. Tanks rolling down the street underneath us and we were sitting there having a martini. <laughs> and then we went out to have dinner and I was kind of surprised when we got in his Jeep. He had a flashlight and a mirror. He checked underneath his airplane to make sure there's no explosives. And we went out for dinner. And we are in this restaurant in Quezon. What was his name? The, the, this this flamboyant uh, Iranian, I mean, uh, uh, Vietnamese colonel that was the vice president. I think Jim knows who he was, probably. And he came in the restaurant, several guards came in there and checked everybody, and he and his wife came in and sat down at the table next to us. Well, the next day, and this was a very interesting series of flights, the next day, I went back to Kadena still didn't have an aircraft assigned. And the command post said a, a young captain by the name of Captain Alexander was in the hospital for the flu. I wanted to know if I'd fly the airplane back to the States. I said, sure, and I thought that's one of my job. So I took over that aircraft and flew from there to Kadena. From, I'm sorry, from Kadena to Midway, which was about 11 hours. That was kind of a normal flight for us to Midway Island. Midway Island, I don't know how many of you have been to Midway Island, but Midway Island was, was a very, very interesting stop. 
In the first place, it was the home of the goody birds, the laysan albatross. The laysan albatross spent about four months of the year during the summer months in the North Pacific on water. And in October, about half a million of them come back to Midway. They're always very interesting when they come back because they had forgotten how to land on land. That's number one or one thing. They come in and land with their feet spread out and they think they're going to land in water and they hit the ground and they go head over sea, ass over tea kettle before they learn how to land on land. The sailors, these are big birds. They're about 24 pounds, 11 foot wingspan for an adult. The sailors there, because they're kind of bored in midway, they pick some big, day, big males and they gouge them with food to get them overloaded. Then they try to flush them off with white t-shirts. They have to make a run and take off. And these damn goony birds overweight would get a couple inches off the ground and stall out and go ass over tea cut. <laughs> Another thing that, that these sailors would do, you'd have the infertile sea females who didn't have an egg to sit on. So they'd put a bowling, I mean a cue ball, or a tennis ball underneath the nest and these female albatrosses would squat down on this bowl, this cue ball or tennis ball and try to hatch it several months. <laughs> Never saw one hatching cue ball. There was a there was a friend of mine who was he was in the Air Force but he was stationed there in Midway. He had been, we had been stationed together, we had flown together in Germany. He and his wife Jackie, she was a feisty little gal. And they were to spend a year there, they were to spend a year there. And they were living in a marine kind of a cottage like, and they had invited me over for dinner. Now these albatrosses, these goody birds, they're monog monogamous. They lived there up about 60 years. And they were when they returned to Midway, the females will nest as close to the exact spot that they were before, year after year. And when Dick invited me to the house, to go over to his house, he says, now be careful. He says, because there's a female goody bird who was sitting in her nest right in front of her screen door. And you can only open the screen door about two feet. You have to scoot in sideways. His wife, Jackie, she had formed a bond of friendship with this goony bird, and she called it Matilda. And we were sitting there in the living room. Jackie was in the kitchen fixing dinner, and Dick was fixing the martini in the living room, and we were running out of gin. And he yelled to Jackie, and he said, Jackie, Lou and I are going to go to the liquor store to get a bottle of gin and some wine, and we'll be back in a little bit. She said, well, don't be gone too long, and when you leave, don't disturb Matilda. Well, Dick, he was getting sick and tired of it, all the patience to paint the Matilda. So as we started to go out the door, he swung this green, green, store, green door, screen door, and he says, to hell with you, Matilda. And he swung the screen door open and knocked Matilda off her nest. Well, Matilda didn't take too kindly to this. And as we got outside, Matilda was clocking, ca -ca 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 -ca, and her head was bouncing, bouncing up and down as she climbed back in her nest. And Dick, he said, screw you, Matilda. And he put his hand down and like a cobra, she went Shoo. She struck it and cut him, put about a one inch cut in his wrist, I mean, the top of his hand. Jeez, the blood started running out. And I wrapped his hand in a handkerchief, held it above his head, and we entered the emergency room. And they, but the, the, the airman there gave Dick a shot, a tetanus, tetanus shot, and called the doctor. The doctor came over and he says, holy Christ, he says, that's a bad cut, Major, how'd that happen? And he says, Matilda Bentley. <laughs> and the doc says, Matilda, Matilda who? And he says, the goody bird my wife calls Matilda. He says, I knocked her off her nest. And the doc says, that'll do it. <laughs> so he, st he stitched his hand, her, his hand up, and wrapped it up in a big bandage. We went by the liquor store and got a bottle of gin and wine. And we got back to the house. There was Matilda sitting at our desk and we screwed it sideways in. And Jackie said, what took you guys so damn long? And Dick, what happened to your hand? He says, well, Matilda bit me. 
when I knocked her off her nest. And she says, I told you guys to be careful with Matilda. If you had knocked me off when you're my nest, he said, I would have bit you in a place that you wouldn't be able to wrap like your hand. <laughs> About this time, the duty officer at, at Midway called and said, Colonel, we found a rat on your airplane. I says, Democrat or Republican? <laughs> And he says, no, no. He says, it's a four-legged one with a long tail. I said, it must be a Democrat. <laughs> he can take too kindly to my humor. But a rat on board an airplane is very serious. They can, they can nibble on wiring and cause fire. So he said, your airplane will be sealed for 24 hours. They put net, uh, rat traps in there. And then they, some people with wearing uh, gas masks they set off poison gas containers throughout the airplane and sealed it up for 24 hours, hoping to kill the rats. So we're going to be there until the next night. And finally, when they said the airplane was ready to go, we went out to take off at night. We usually like to take off at night at Midway because the goody birds were not quite as active at night. We got up to about 21,000, cruising along, beautiful night. The load master went downstairs to use the urinal, and he came back in and he says, Colonel, I saw a rat running across the cargo compartment. And I said, damn, they didn't get them all. I said, what we're going to do to kill that damn Democrat rat, depressurize, I told everybody to put on a jacket, a heavy jacket, told the flight engineer to depressurize the aircraft so we'd have a 21,000 21, cabin altitude. I said, that'll kill those damn rats. <laughs> so, of course, it got pretty damn cold. And after about 20, 25 minutes, the flight engineer said, how long are we going to sit here unpressurized? I said, well, go ahead and pressurize the aircraft. Those rats have got to be dead by now. If we find a live one, I'll take them home as a pet. <laughs> so, we repressurized. We were sitting there for another hour or so, and the, the old bastard said, I'm not sure we killed those rats. I'm going to put part of my sandwich downstairs in the car apartment to see if there's still a live rat. A little while later, he came back and he says, Colonel, I have some bad news for you. He says, I saw a rat nibbling on my sandwich. I tried to catch him because I knew you wanted to take him home as a pet, but he got away from me. <laughs> so I thought, damn, we get to Travis. We're going to have to report rats in the airplane again. That's okay because Travis was a nice spot. So we are sitting there about five hours to go before Travis. Now it's at 23,000. Beautiful night. Smooth air. The co-pilot had gone back to take a cat nap. The engineer was sitting in front of his hundreds of gauges with the heat coming off, and he was trying to stay awake. I looked back at the navigator, and his head was bobbing. And I tilted the seat way back. And I tuned in a cable, cable radio station in San Francisco, KBL. Beautiful music. I had the seat tilted back. I had the headset on. I was listening to music. What a joyful night. I could look out and I could see the Polaris, the Big Dipper, an occasional uh, falling star. And I was really enjoying myself. And I don't know how long I sat in that position in this nice warm cockpit, relaxing. And I saw a shooting star shoot down in front of the aircraft, going off to the left. And I followed it over the horizon. But there was something wrong with this picture, Bob. There was something wrong with that picture. I looked down and I couldn't see Polaris. <laughs> and I looked, and hell, I couldn't see Polaris. I looked at the RMI, the remote magnetic indicator, on the instant panel, it said 090. If I'm going 090, I should be able to see Polaris. And I put the seat up right, turned the instrument lights on. I looked up at the standby compass and it says 180 degrees. So what we had lost, the flux gate compass out in the wing had failed. And the aircraft was an autopilot and it slowly drifted off to 180 degrees. But how long had we flown that, I didn't know. We may be down in the air traffic between Honolulu and San Francisco, so. I woke up the navigator, told him to get up in the astrodome, take some star shots. And he came back, and we were about 250 miles off course. So we got a direct course from our present position back to Travis. 
this particular flight is not over yet. We landed at, at uh, got into radio contact with Travis, and I said, we have, we have to report rats on board. And he said, Democrats or Republic? And I said, must be a libertarian because we couldn't kill them. <laughs> and so he must have heard the same joke. Anyway, we landed at Travis, and the navigator, the co-pilot, and I were sitting in the DOQ in flight suits, having a cold beer, and then walked two MPs. One looked like a weightlifter. Geez, he was really built. And he walked up and he said, are you Colonel Martin? I said, yes, I am. He said, you have to come with us. I says, why? He says, I don't know. He says, but all my instructions are to bring you with us, peacefully preferred, but in handcuffs is necessary. I said, geez. He said, I'm putting down your beer. So I put down my beer, and I went with these MPs, and they took me over to a building. There were three civilians in there. They showed me their ID. They're OSI agents. And they read me my Miranda rights. And then they started asking me all kinds of questions, routine questions about my basic military career and so on. It was obvious that they had my dossier and they had all the information they wanted to know if I was telling the truth. And I was. And finally I told them, I said, you know, I picked up this airplane in Kadena. They said, we know that. And I said, Captain Alexander had it before and he was in the hospital with the flu. And they said, we know that. And I said, what the hell's going on? And they said, well, there's a ring of people, maybe GIs, but BCs in Saigon that are stashing AK-47s in some of these airplanes, hiding behind the soundproofing and so on. And the 133 is a perfect airplane that there's so many places to hide them and they know they're going to be at Travis for quite a while. And then they have an agent in Travis who will offload this airplane and these guns, AK-47s, and sell them on the black market. They said, so we, we suspect that there's AK-47s on board your aircraft. And I said, well, you can't go on board the aircraft and steal because of rats. And they said, we know that, but as soon as it's released, we'll look into it. But you won't be leaving here for about three days while we're seeing if the people pick up the weapons. Anyway, I don't know what ever happened. About three days later, we were released, and I flew the airplane back to uh, Dover. The uh, C-133s at that point, I mentioned that we had lost six airplanes. And it was really an interesting airplane to fly. It was basically comfortable, it was noisy as hell, a lot of vibrations, like I mentioned, the prop tips were supersonic at all times. But once you, the cockpit itself wasn't too bad when you had the big headsets on and you're away from the prop line. On the prop line, if you go down along the prop line in the cargo part, it would shake your fillings out. Just unbelievable. In 19, April 1967, a C-133 departed Kadena and they were at 12,000 feet. They lost control of all four propellers. It was the Curtis Electric propellers, and they lost control of all four propellers. And as they made a descent, this is in the book in detail, as they made their descent, the blade angle was stuck around 40 degrees, and as it got down lower altitude, they were trying to get into Kadena. It overloaded the engine, and all four engines flamed out. And from 2,500 feet, they ditched in the Pacific Ocean. I was given about one hour notice to go over to Clam on 141. I was to be the investigating officer, private officer for that accident. Anyway, this captain, Captain Reagan, Major Reagan, Reagan, he did a nice job. They ditched in the Pacific, had 10 crew members and a double crew of that airplane. All of them got out, or most of them, I will, read, I will say, and they were huddled around a floating nose gear and they were counting noses, and there was a flight engineer missing. But this time, the helicopters were arriving to pick up the crew members, and they picked up the ones that were floating in the water to take them back to Kadena. And Major Reagan, I give him credit, he said, we're missing a crew member. We're not leaving until we see if we can find him. The aircraft, when it ditched, 
when I dished the bottom of the fuselage tore back like a sardine can, and it rolled inverted. As the helicopters hovered over that wreckage, they could peer down in a mass of wreckage and aircraft debris. And they thought they saw a body amongst this debris. A young, brave pararescueman said, lower me down in a sling. And they lowered him down, and he found this engineer still alive. And he called for a basket to be lowered. The aircraft wreckage was sinking. He called for a basket to be lowered. And he put this engineer in this basket, held, hoisted it up the helicopter, and then later, as the wreckage was sinking, he was pulled up in the sling. I interviewed all 10 crew members on this. In February 1970, we lost our last C-133. This would have been the eighth one. This was a per terrible loss for me, personally, because the aircraft commander was a personal friend of mine, Bill Tabor, who had flown together in Germany. They were over in Nebraska, climbing to 25,000 feet. And listen to this. They were climbing to 25,000 feet. And right along the prop line, the front of that the front of the aircraft separated. It separated and floated out separately from the rest of the wreckage. Here were these five crew members sitting in this airplane at night, which you've all been there, sitting in this airplane at night in a nice warm environment, flying along at 25,000 feet, and all of a sudden explosive decompression, everything goes blank, cold, no noise, throttles have no action, controls have no action, because the front of the aircraft had blown off and the rest of it. There was an old, it was basically an easy accident to investigate. Metallurgist found an old fatigue crack along the prop line. And when he went to higher altitude, that crack propagated around the fuselage like a crack in an eggshell. Those guys were in the front of that airplane. The figure it took about three minutes to float down. They had no parachutes, of course. We didn't carry parachutes. And that was the last accident that we had in the 133s. They still didn't want to discontinue the use of the 133s because the war in Vietnam was still on. So they. If you see any 133s in the museums now, you'll see from the prop line forward about every 18 inches, there's a stainless steel band that's wrapped around that aircraft that is designed to stop any cracks from this light drilling a hole in the plastic windshield to stop crack. So when you look at this airplane from a distance, it looked like duct tape. And we, and we used to say, Jesus, now they want us to fly airplanes held together with duct tape. And that's what it looked like. There was one other accident that hit me personally. Name of aircraft commander Jack Culp. Jack was a B-47 pilot during World War II. Shot down a couple of German aircraft before he was shot down himself and was a prisoner of war. And we had a mission that we would fly an airplane to Greenville, Texas for overhaul. It was a nice mission. We used it as kind of a benefit because they were given first class treatment in a hotel and first class air fare back. So Jack came to me, was a personal friend, a little bit older, and he said, Lou, he said, I haven't had any of those flights down to Greenville. Could I take the next one? I said, sure, Jack, I'll sign you the next one. Jack Culp and his crew flew that airplane to Greenville, Texas, and the company that was to overhaul that airplane were to fly them to Love Field in an, in an aero commander. We had two company personnel on, personnel on, and our crew of five. We didn't need a navigator for stateside, but we put one on because it was a, it was a goody trip. En route to Love Field, the wing came off that Aero Commander. And it spiraled down and crashed in the schoolyard just a few minutes before the school would have been, there would have been hundreds of skilled children coming out from school. Of course, everybody on board was killed. There was an AD for enforcing that main wing spar that was not fulfilled in an aircraft. And here's this guy that asked me to take this trip. And a simple thing like that, he was killed. Uh, there's one more. I was flying a mission from, 
I was at Travis, and they said I had a special mission. mission. Westmoreland was complaining that he wasn't getting the uniforms that the Marines were, and he would call President Johnson, and President Johnson said to send a load of uniforms, the Marine style uniforms to Vietnam. So I was sent to Hill Air Force Base in Ogden, Utah, to pick up a load of uniforms in cardboard boxes, very light. We landed there, and they filled the car compartment with boxes on the floor right up to the city. The car compartment was just jammed back when they were light. We took off at night to go to Travis, and we were at 23,000 feet, and the flight engineer said he was having a difficulty pressurizing. There's an air leak somewhere. The flight is, extra flight engineer said, I'll go downstairs and see. And he went to the car compartment and a few minutes later, whoosh, explosive decompression, the air cockpit filled with, with mist. We lost pressurization and we all put on an oxygen mask, made an emergency descent, got down to around 12,000 feet. But we could take our oxygen mask off and we counted noses. The flight engineer that had gone to the car compartment didn't come back. So I knew that we had experienced explosive decompression and it wouldn't be the first time that we lost a crew member that was blown overboard. So I was thinking, my God, I told the navigator, put in your map where we are so in case we can tell the rescue people where the body might be found and, uh, over the mountains. A few minutes later, this engineer comes into the cockpit hair sticking almost straight up, white as a ghost, and he can hardly talk. And we says, what the hell happened? And he says, I went downstairs, I thought I heard when the air was leaking, somewhere on top of these boxes. And he said, I was crawling across the top of these boxes on my stomach when the emergency hatch on top of the aircraft blew off, and it took me with it. He said, I was halfway out of the airplane, and I was hanging on to cargo straps. And he said, I was finally able to pull myself back in. And he said, I lost my hat. <laughs> He's damn near blowing out of the aircraft. All right, I talked more than I should. But it was a very interesting airplane. Uh, the, uh, if you want to read more about it, you can read about it in my book. And we've got time for one or two questions. And that's it. Yeah. Did you comment that they had Curtis Electric Pops? Yes, it had, a, it had a Pratt & Whitney. When the Air Force decided to buy that airplane, they said it was the airplane that they needed at the time. Lockheed and Boeing were working on jet aircraft. They had nothing to provide. Douglas had on their drawing board a turboprop airplane. The Air Force said they needed a turboprop for short takeoff and landings because the jets in those days were, would require a lot of runway. So Douglas had 133 on the drawing board. The Air Force said, this is what we need. Build 50 of them on a fast track program. They had to go to Pratt & Whitney for a T-64 engine. They needed 7,500 horsepower each. They went to Curtis Electric for a prop. It was basically the same prop that was used for the V-36. And it was Curtis Electric. The Curtis Electric props were the problems that he had with the old Martin V-26. That's right. Yeah. And it was, but they didn't have the, they didn't have the super after takeoff, the prop tips were continuously supersonic. And that set up tremendous vibration. Okay, everybody still awake? Thanks, Vince. <laughs> nice job, Lou. Yeah. I'll bring it next week. <laughs>